Ladies and gentlemen, I am Junichiro Ida from Sapporo in Japan. First of all, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to Dr. Ono, the president of IOC, and the organizers for other meetings for giving me the opportunity to present our work in this conference. This slide shows my professional career and educational background as a self-introduction. In connection with this lecture, I declare that there are no companies with a COI relationship to disclose. Let me start. In my presentation, I would first like to introduce the equilibrium theory for the stability of occlusion and tooth position. I will then talk about the relationship between lip incompetence, which is a condition in which the lips are always open, and the position of teeth. Finally, I will present the results of our previous studies on the effects of myofunctional therapy to improve lip incompetence. Dr. Angle described in his paper in 1899 that the harmonious relations of dental arches are assisted by muscular pressure with the tongue acting on the inside of dental arches and the lips and cheeks acting on the outside of dental arches. He stated that this should be considered to be a very important checkpoint for the stability of occlusion and dentition after orthodontic treatment. This idea was named the equilibrium theory by Weinstein et al. This is a case in which a tongue guard was attached to the lingual side of the incisors to eliminate contact of the tongue with the mandibular incisors. As shown on the right photograph, the incisors had moved to the lingual side after a few months. This was possibly induced by the force of the lips from the outside of the dental arch. What is the strength of the force exerted by the lips and tongue on the teeth? There have been many studies on this, but I will show you data obtained by Dr. Kato here. Similar data have been obtained by other researchers. The continuous force of the lips or tongue in contact with teeth in a rest situation is less than five grams per square centimeter. Also, it seems that intermittent force of less than 20 gram per square centimeter is applied when swallowing or when talking. You can see that even with such a very weak force, the teeth will move as shown in the tongue guard case. Here, the question arises as to whether the intermittent force that is applied by the dynamic action of muscles, such as when swallowing or when talking, or the continuous weak force that is applied by soft tissue around the mouth in a rest situation, which mainly contributes to tooth movement. Let's think a little about this point. As you know, in order for a tooth to move in the alveolar bone, many osteoclasts must appear in the compressed periodontal ligament as shown in the photograph on the right. Osteoclasts are produced by cell fusion of osteoclast progenitor cells that migrate from microvessels. When these progenitor cells migrate outside the vessels, there is always a change in the movement of these cells in microvessels. White blood cells, including osteoclast progenitor cells, undergo 
rolling and subsequently under, adhere to the sub surfaces of inferior cells just before migration outside the vessel. Now, let me show you the difference between the behaviors of white blood cells in microvessels in an intermittent compression condition and continuous compression condition. As can be seen here, continuous weak pressure as shown on the right side induces more roaring of cells and adherence of cells to the inferior cell surfaces than does intermittent pressure as shown in the left video. Let me quantify these results as a graph. It could be considered that continuous compression shown as a red column contributes more to the induction of osteoclasts than does intermittent compression indicated as a yellow column. From these results, when considering the stability of the position of teeth, it can be considered that it is important to pay more attention to the posture of the muscles and soft tissues around the oral cavity in a rest situation, rather than dynamic swallowing or talking action. Therefore, we focused on the state of lip closure at rest. Then we tried to determine by using cephalograms whether the labiolingual position of incisors differs in lip competent subjects and lip incompetent subjects. The lip closure state, that is whether the lips are closed or apart, was detected electronically using such a touch sensor. First, we determined lip competent subjects and lip incompetent subjects from 30 subjects who had normal occlusion. We measured the lip close state as the seal lip time ratio of each subject. This ratio is the ratio of lip closure time to the measured time. We used two awake conditions for measurement. One condition was during a concentration task in which mathematical calculations were performed for 15 minutes, and the other condition was during relaxation while listening to soothing music for 15 minutes. On the basis of the values of seal lip time ratio under the two awake conditions, we tried to make groups using cluster analysis for multivariate analysis. As a result, we were able to divide the subjects into three groups of A, B, and C. The average sealed lip time ratio under the two conditions for each group are shown. Group A has a large sealed lip time ratio under both conditions and group B has a small value under both conditions. In group C, the seal lip time ratio were different in the two conditions. The results of our previous research showed that person who had a high seal lip time ratio during both awake conditions, that is during the concentration task and during relaxation, also had a high seal lip time ratio during sleep. On the other hand, it had been clarified that a person who had a low seal lip time ratio during both awake conditions also had a low seal lip time ratio during sleep. As a result, we were able to divide the subjects into a group of lip competent subjects for whom it was thought that their lips were closed for almost 24 hours a day 
and a group of lip incompetent subjects for whom it was thought that their lips were apart for almost 24 hours a day. The occlusal state of the subjects was almost normal occlusion. After dividing the subjects into a group of lip competent subjects and a group of lip incompetent subjects, several grams of subjects in the two groups were used to compare tooth positions. Let me show you the results. These are the measurement items that had significant differences between the two groups of lip competence and lip incompetence in the cephalogram analysis. But since it is a little difficult to understand these items in a table, I will explain it with a profilogram in the next slide. This figure shows the average profilogram for each group of lip competent and lip incompetent subjects. The red line for lip incompetent subjects clearly showed the anterior position of both the upper and lower incisors relative to the facial plane as compared to the green line for lip competent subjects. So far, it has been clarified that the anterior and posterior stable positions of incisors differ depending on the lip closure state, even if all of the subjects have normal occlusion. Now, can the state of lip closure in these lip incompetent subjects be improved? William Ziegfuss encourages bottom pull as a training method to acquire a lip closure state as a myofunctional therapy. This is a method using a large button that is inserted into the oral vestibule and pulled by a string. Although this method is introduced in textbooks, it seems that there are still many unknown regarding the setting of conditions and the effects of the exercise. Therefore, we examine the training conditions and the effects of the exercise. There are two main purposes of the exercise as muscular exercise. One is exercise to increase muscular strength and the other is muscular endurance exercise. It is not clear which of them is better for achieving lip closure. In the field of sports medicine, it is known that hypoxic exercise is effective for increasing muscular strength. Hypoxic exercise is a method for exercising while keeping a low oxygen concentration in the muscle. On the other hand, Aerobic exercise is effective for increasing muscular endurance. Aerobic exercise is a method for exercising while maintaining a high oxygen concentration in the muscle. Therefore, we measured oxygen saturation in orbicular resource muscles and examined the op optimum conditions for training in which aerobic exercise or hypoxic exercise was performed. We also examined the changes in muscular strength, muscular endurance, and lip closure state after four weeks of each exercise. The results showed that 20 repetitions of hanging a weight of 50% of maximum strength for five seconds and resting for five seconds are appropriate as aerobic exercise with maintenance of a high oxygen concentration in the muscle. On the other hand, the result shows that five repetitions of hanging a weight of 80% of maximum muscular strength 
for five seconds and resting for five seconds are appropriate for hypoxic exercise with maintenance of low oxygen concentration in the muscle. The subject with lip incompetence performed each of these exercises for four weeks and the muscular strength, muscular endurance of the orbicular resorus muscle and sealed lip time ratio were determined before and after the exercises to examine the effects of the exercises. The graph on the left shows the changes in muscular strength of the orbicular resorus muscle during the four week periods of aerobic and hypoxic exercises. The blue line shows the results of hypoxic exercise and the red line shows the results of aerobic exercise. As expected, you can see that muscular strength tended to increase more with hypoxic exercise. As shown in the graph on the right, it can be seen that the muscular endurance of the orbicular resorus muscle increased similarly with both aerobic exercise and hypoxic exercise. Looking at changes in the lip closure state, subjects who had lip incompetence before the start of training achieved almost 90% lip closure time after four weeks of training with either aerobic exercise or hypoxic exercise. The results suggest that the increase in endurance of the orbicularis muscle contributes greatly to the improvement in lip closing ability. This graph shows the results of follow-up of the lip closure state for two months after completion of the exercises. It can be seen that a sealed lip time ratio exceeding 80% was maintained for two months after completion of the exercises. As a conclusion, it is thought that bottom pole training can improve the condition of lip closure in patients with lip incompetence, regardless of whether the training is performed by aerobic exercise or hypoxic exercise. Next, I will present the result of the examination of the orbicular resource muscle activity using electromyograms in lip incompetent subjects and lip competent subjects. As shown on the left, lip competent people have natural lip closure. However, as shown on the right, it is often observed in lip incompetent people that instruction to close their lips causes tension in the perioral muscles including the orbicular resorus muscle. To observe this objectively, we attached electromyographic sensors to the upper and lower lips and measured the muscular activity in the orbicular resorus muscle. A typical electromyographic waveforms are shown on the left, upper, and lower figures. When instructed to lightly close their lips, no major electromyographic changes were seen for lip competent subjects as shown in the upper left graph. As shown in the lower left graph, large muscle activity was observed during lip lightly closing in subjects with lip incompetence. On the right is the graph of an integrated electromyogram when the lips are lightly closed. It can be seen that subjects with lip incompetence have a significantly greater amount of muscle activity during light closure of the lips as shown by the blue column.
Next, we examine the effects of bottom pull exercise on muscular activity of the orbicularis oris muscle at the time of lip closure. Lip incompetent subjects performed bottom pull training by hypoxic exercise for four weeks and we measured muscle activity as the integrated value of electromyogram of the orbicularis oris muscle when instructing light closure of the upper and lower lips. The results for the upper and lower lips were the same. Although large activity of the orbicularis oris muscle was observed at just before starting the training, lip contact without large activity of the muscles became possible after four weeks of exercise. Furthermore, the condition after the exercise was maintained for two months after completion of the training. The results are surprising because they indicated the possibility that the increasing endurance of the orbicularis oris muscle obtained by the muscular exercise may not directly lead to the acquisition of lip closure function. So why is it that natural lip closure function was achieved by bottom pull training? Although the reason is not known, one possibility is that the bottom pull training also strengthened the facial expression muscles as well as the orbicularis oris muscle and it thus became possible to close the lips without significant activity of the orbicular resource muscle. Furthermore, I think that it is necessary to consider the contribution of the field of brain science to master the pattern of activity of muscles. Although the mechanism underlying the effects of muscle training is still unknown, it can be said that myofunctional therapy of bottom pull can improve a lip incompetent state to a lip competent state. This slide shows a summary of this presentation. As one of the causes of relapse of malocclusion after orthodontic treatment, we should consider the balance of the steady, weak, continuous force that the teeth receive from the lips, cheeks, and tongue. The stable anterior-posterior position of the anterior teeth of the person with lip incompetence is more anterior than that of a person with good lip closure. Exercising the perioral muscles with bottom pull as myofunctional therapy can result in good lip closure function in patients with lip incompetence. I think that the development of orthodontics up to now is due to the great success of many researchers and clinicians from the 19th century. In the field of diagnostics, Morphological analysis has made dramatic progress with the advent of cephalometric analysis and has also made great progress in research on growth and development. Finally, I would like to conclude this presentation as follows. I think it is necessary to pay more attention to individual differences imperial functions when considering the goals of orthodontic treatment. I think that further progress in research is needed to understand the functional backgrounds in the craniofacial region, which was the focus of this presentation. I think that more efforts are needed to develop methods for examining the functional backgrounds of muscles related to malocclusion and methods for analyzing cases with this background. By doing so, 
orthodontics will be greatly developed and more reliable results of orthodontic treatment will be able to be obtained. And I believe that we will be able to contribute more to the health and happiness of people. I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the professors and researchers involved in the research that I have, I have presented here. These are the papers whose data were shown in the presentation. Other papers. Thank you for your kind attention.